really excited to talk to you. Um, I've been doing a little bit of stalking about on you. I went and saw a photo of you at the New York Stock Exchange uh, with Fiscal Note going uh, IPO. Found that you have a website called Machine Opening, and I did a little bit of prep here. So hopefully, uh, I can make sure that it's uh, it's worth uh, the time. So, <laughs> all right, awesome. Uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, you and what you do at Fiscal Note, and or not just for me, like for the people who are listening to you right now. Yeah, I came here to the U.S. in the early '90s. I think I've always been interested in how um, machines, which have been coming online basically since I was in elementary school, uh, middle school, right? How machines, how computers can really help with our day-to-day -day lives of what we what we want to do. At first, obviously, it was very early kind of playing games on uh, on like, you know, floppy disks. Uh, they quickly evolved into starting to, to learn how to code, basically in middle school, taking the coding classes in high school. And then I really got a passion for computer science. So uh, you might find out a little bit later in this discussion that I like arguing a lot, I like basically testing ideas against each other, right? So like our ideas can fail much quicker than we can in real life. And I think that helps validate a lot of the work that we want to do or could do. And so I knew I wanted to, to have that side of me. So that was more aligned with philosophy. Like I, I can reference that back now. So there was a part of me that really wanted to get into philosophy and understand how the world works, epistemology, metaphysics, um, and understand how you know we fit in. And then the other side of me that was already there uh, that I guess I can name to now again is the builder side is to try to create using automation, using computers, was really interested in how to marry those two. And so in college and undergrad, I was doing comp sci and philosophy and the natural kind of consequence of that um, was getting into the AI courses that we were offering and starting to do machine learning. And uh, in my undergrad, I was really focused on natural language processing. So working on unstructured data, but specifically the language interactions that we have. Uh, and this was early days before you know IBM Watson, before a lot of the things that you're now accustomed to seeing. Uh, and so people had a, a lot of really grandiose visions for what we could do, but not quite there in the terms of the technology. And so I was really interested in pursuing that. So I got my PhD in computer science, specifically in developing large-scale systems for language processing, using machine learning and various other things. And then when I was coming out of that, I was then, again, interested in kind of in this entrepreneurial mindset of, like, how can I learn as much as possible about what it means to apply this in a real-world setting? So often the choices are, and this is not true anymore, but at the time, going into a research lab and being a part of a either academic or industry research lab, and that's obviously exciting uh, and a lot of friends and coworkers in those places. Um, but I was really interested in joining really early stage startup where I could practice my skill set. So I, I wouldn't ignore that, right? It would still be a core part of the necessary needs, but also learn how everything else works, how, how to basically apply that in a way that um, builds great products, helps people understand and do things. And so I'm around um, people who are lawyers. Uh, and so I, I live in, in DC. So that's kind of, again, a natural consequence of, of the area I'm in. And so a lot of my interest was in computational law, computational journalism, and how do those things evolve? Like basically what we're seeing now you know, with LMs, there's so much content creation that can happen automatically. Where is that right marriage of human expertise and automation that can build that in? And so Fiscal Note, when I joined um, a little over 10 years ago, you know, it was fewer than 10 people. So I joined as one of the first employees uh, and then I've been lucky enough uh, to be part of that ride, like you said, from there to when we went uh, <clears throat> in public on the New York Stock Exchange uh, in 22. Uh, and so we've been public for a few years now. I can kind of compare the, the entire cycle of it. Uh, but essentially what Fiscal Note does is we take a lot of both public and bespoke uh, content that we're creating about geopolitical policy market intelligence and use that to power a number of different SaaS applications as well as data products. And so, you know, whether you're a small nonprofit or a huge five, you know, F100, F500, you know, multinational organization, you have risks and opportunities associated with, with different people in government, with different agencies, with different governments across the world are doing. And so we try to collect all that information from the outside world and build analyses using AI, that's where I come in and my teams come in, and the actual content uh, specialists and the subject matter expertise in the different areas of the world and different industries, marry those two to provide that insight to our clients who then can either act by you know, advocating for or against certain policies or adopting that internally. Uh, and so kind of Fiscal is a legal or reg tech company, if you want to summarize it quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's really awesome because when I was researching after I spoke to you about fiscal loan, I was like, now this is a very, very interesting use case. So what I did was I went and checked out Tim, Tim, uh, Tim Huang, who's the co-founder CEO. I went and checked out his profile a little bit to just to see who, what kind of people you hang out with, right? <laughs> so it was such a fascinating uh, story of him. Uh, I think he was talking about how he um, 
was part of the Obama um, you know, campaign and worked there and was really interested in making a difference and uh, wanted to focus on what can we do around these laws and things that come out and how can we make informed decisions based on that, right? And that was sort of like the introduction to me uh, learning more about Fiscal Note. And what you guys have built here is a completely unique product and a, a company that uh, focuses on this particular aspect. And it seems like you guys worked on this AI and built that from the very beginning, like data and AI was core to what you were trying to do. And of course, you brought up natural language processing. I mean, last two years is basically a house party for Gen AI and natural language. Pro- How were you able to like foresee like this is where it's going? And early when you joined the company, what were the kind of core conversations you were having? For me, language was one of the, the frontiers um, that was just really obvious that the way that we interact with people should be more like the way we interact with computers. So there's this kind of, I would say, blip in human history that we went from kind of, you know, no technology or no, no computers. Uh, sorry, obviously there's been always been technology. Uh, the specific kind of technology we're talking about, uh, computers and the way we interact with them and the way we program them. And then, you know, we got keyboards and mouses and, and monitors and the way that we program. And you have the special group of people who are able to write code in the way that computers are able to interpret it. And even that's evolved, right? Like you went from like, you know, assembly level code to high level abstractions, like level one, two, three, four kind of languages. And now you're you know able to have people who are reasonably uh, confident in, in programming computers without a lot of the fundamentals of understanding how the, all the hardware works. But now you've gotten even further out to that point of not even knowing or not needing to know LMs. And so I was always very passionate about language as a way of interaction, of transmitting information, uh, and as a way that we basically experience the world and learn the world. And so I was you know, taking that, um, it, but I would say that I was also equally passionate about the way that we can create systems that learn. And so language just happens to be one of the things that we learn. We also learn vision and touch and, you know, we can build robotics in the real world, but kind of learning systems in general, that's where my passion was. And so, I mean, the evolution of of those things just keeps, keeps going, right? Like the kinds of problems we solve and the challenges that we run into. And so when I was uh, kind of getting into the field, um, you know, the biggest challenges were building kind of these um, machine learning algorithms that were able to start generalizing from one domain to the next uh, to be able to, again, scale it to take, a bigger data set than you can have on your one machine and be able to actually scale it across a number of different computers. And so things like MapReduce were coming out um, of Yahoo and sort of like Hadoop and other places where you can start to implement that. Spark was just coming out and being able to parallelize different processing things. And so um, you had to build your own. It was already in the cloud. You know, we didn't start off building in Fiscal Note uh, on-prem, but it was early, early days in the cloud. And so we started off with Rackspace where we had to do a lot more of our own uh, kind of maintenance and then move to AWS. And so uh, the early days conversations, particularly around kind of, you know, let's go back to data and AI is, um, you know, we knew that a lot of information was out there on the web publicly, but it was very hard to access. And so that's one of the big, I think, challenges in general for, for companies um, that wanted to collect data from, from public sources is that, yes, it's accessible. Yes, it's technically public. It's not a proprietary data set, but it's actually very difficult to access a lot of data sets that are public, even on the internet. And so, you know, if governments were better at, they spent a lot more time putting out data sets in RSS feeds and APIs and keeping them updated and having databases that people could be accessing, then you know, part of what a lot of companies like ours do would not be as useful. But given that data is so spread out across the internet, just saying like we have data, you know, it doesn't mean much. It's about how useful is it. It's how useful is it to not just you know, for you to be able to do something with, but then for you to present that to customers so that they know how to deal with that and work on it. And so part of our moat and our differentiation from the very beginning was, you know, how can we um, get really good at identifying sources of data online, the public data sources that we think will be valuable to our clients. Then how do we bring those in efficiently? And so the sites break, there's all sorts of things that change, things come up. Webmasters don't like you scraping their site more than X amount of times per day. Like we want to be good citizens of the internet. And so how do we make sure that we can build systems that are resilient to changes while also minimizing the maintenance time that we have on our side to be able to actually update and change. And then once you bring the data in, then how do you actually start to work on it. So like you, you want to normalize it, you know, we're dealing with tens of thousands of different localities across, you know, 15,000 so cities in the US to you know, dozens of, of countries and all of their different localities and different aspects. And so, you know, we want to standardize it in a way so that when you ask a question like, you know, what's my regulatory exposure to introducing a healthcare product in Brazil, you know, we want to be able to answer that question by bringing to bear a number of different sources. Like you and I are not thinking about, oh, well, you collected this information from Congress, you collect this information from Twitter. You're thinking about, 
you know, what's all of the things that anyone has said, written on, done analysis for, like healthcare products in Brazil. And if we can bring that all together under the hood in, in our ways in that we process it and combine it in a way and then expose it in a way that makes it valuable to you, that's kind of what we've been talking about from the very beginning. So on, on the outside, I think we are you know, a, a legal or rec tech com company. I think for users, we are um, trying to bring them kind of this issues management policy analysis geopolitical market intelligence platform under the hood in the R&D department. We're essentially an information retrieval and data product. And so we need to get really good at bringing in the right data, analyzing it, normalizing it the right way, and then marrying it together across each other so that the, the value of the data actually compounds the more of it we have and the way that we bring it together to then expose it in places that the, the actual user might want to use it, whether it's searching over it, getting alerted on it, or then kind of reporting or taking out some, some other action. What you guys are doing and serving is serving data uh, in a much more structured way from an uh, internet that is so unstructured uh, and making it tangible for people to kind of make decisions on or to understand what it is going to do. Right? That was my read too. But it's interesting what you were saying, right? Look back at 2010 to 2020. We will talk about four things that you just mentioned, uh, the idea of MapReduce and Spark uh, and uh, and the, the birth of, in many ways, uh, I don't know if you remember, the AlexNet paper came out in 2012 and it spurred a bunch of us. Uh, like I was uh, working at a company and, when the paper came out, I was like, oh, damn, I have, I, this looks really fascinating. But just I had no idea as to what this will evolve into until by 2017, you had the from transformation uh, you know, architecture come out. Uh, the uh, attention is all you need. And it just changed everything. So it's just been a decade <laughs> of uh, this happening. And um, I remember running my regression models and running, uh, you know, looking at my gradient boost and try to figure things out like what's going on here you know like it just could, didn't make sense and i don't know if you recall at the time uh, i was programming in r actually which i hated really uh until like i started shifting to python uh, so that was like an interesting era and uh, i don't even know if in 2012 uh, pyspark as a client was available for spark like I, it, what I were you guys using so, don't call me on that so um yeah i mean there was uh <laughs> this, i mean this is funny where uh, it shows you kind of the mentality, right, of of where we were at a given time. So when I started at Fiskano, I just assumed I should be building things from scratch. And so I started to rebuild like, you know, like the TFIDF calculations from scratch for our search and for uh, like logistic regression and max entropy classifiers, uh, kind of like building them myself. Uh, and then obviously, you know, I quickly found that at the time, I think it instilled this packages like, you know, SKLR and, and Jensen for atomic modeling. Uh, and, and they had done a lot of the work. Um, kind of like standardizing some of the core kind of APIs that you would want to make it easier, but certainly things like, you know, auto ML kind of structures and being able to search a parameter space and all of that hadn't come out. So we basically built our own versions of like poor man's, you know, you know, auto ML, um, poor man's kind of like um, MapReduce um, versions of things that became more standardized and more available. Because I think there's also a difference in technology. I think this is also relevant to today's world of, you know, what's possible, like maybe there's a company that is coming out to do this and how infiltrated and how useful it kind of like it is across the actual industry, like the adoption curve basically, right? And so, yeah, there's probably packages people were putting out on various things, you know, but the likelihood that you're keeping up with all the packages come out and that they meet your requirements for everything you want to do and that you can adopt them is, is probably pretty low. So there's a lot of homegrown solutions. Again, at the early 2010s, you know, I think a lot of people were building their own solutions at the time. And even though the open source community was incredibly strong with other kinds of products, that set of like machine learning and AI enabled open source it was uh, just still newer. is yeah. nowhere near um, what it is today. I mean, it's, it's night and day. Um, and again, like what I was saying in terms of just opportunities for um, careers, like I, I think at that point, I would still argue you needed a PhD to be able to go into a product and be able to build out kind of a lot of what you needed to. Didn't have to be a PhD necessarily in you know, computer science. A lot of folks were coming in through like you know, other physics, math kind of PhDs, but you still needed some heavy understanding of the mathematical underpinnings of the actual algorithms to be able to, to provide and actually apply them. Whereas now, um, whether that's good or bad, I guess we can also discuss, uh, you, you don't need a lot of that. You can come in and just kind of jumpstart your abilities to build AI products without even understanding any of the underlying things. So great for some things because it just expands the number of people who can build products and the value of that is incredibly high. You know, bad because you know, when you're running into problems, uh, there's, you know, fewer people who actually understand the core of, of what's going on underneath to be able to, you know, really um, triage uh, and solve the problem kind of in the right way.
Yeah. No, I will quote from what you were saying, this idea that we have added a level of abstraction over the programmer and the language of communication is basically natural, natural language. This goes back to, I don't know if you saw Jensen Huang from NVIDIA about a few weeks ago said that we need we need to we don't everyone in the on the planet should be a programmer that's that's the goal uh and and that's what everybody's building i'm really interested in what you're doing with gen ai maybe we'll touch that in a bit but i'm curious like when you start fiscal node obviously you're coming in 10 people company trying to build something uh that makes sense uh, uh, create see also also evaluate if there is an opportunity for this and very early stages right um so and you had to quickly pivot from just being a scientist to looking at a product. And I'm, I'm pretty sure looking at it as a product owner at times and seeing how to build product out, how to lay infrastructure out, how to think about scale. How did that transition happen for you? I think that's one of the most exciting things about being in a startup anywhere, uh, you know, whether it's successful or not, is the kind of constant pace of needing to put on new hats and take off old hats and be able to evolve quickly, right? And so I think that's what people talk about is, now, maybe some people are not as excited by that, and that's totally fine, right? But so if you're kind of excited by the kind of the drive that's created by this resource constrained timeline constrained environment, I mean, there's no kind of better feeling, I think, in the world. My analogy is like if you're imagining like you're on a, a project, like a college project, except every member of that team is giving 110%. It's like you're not the only guy working on it, which is kind of usually the case, right? And it's four people kind of playing uh, some in the background. There's everyone is dedicated 110% to that mission. And it is you know, incredibly powerful to see what that kind of unified mission and vision alignment can do and to ignore some of the things that are not as critical to the <clears throat> day-to-day success, right? And so while it's absolutely necessary to have a longer-term vision in mind, like you want to be able to have a roadmap uh, in, in your mind of like, well, here's where we think we can get to, like here's our, our, our vision of what the world could look like. You know, we need to have that like here, you know, if we're successful in 10 years, we think the world will have a, a much more natural way of interacting with legal and regulatory data so that anyone can find what they are looking for, um, you know, with as easy as a question, right? Like that could be a vision. The the mission then is how do we apply that kind of, you know, our overall values, our structures day to day, what kind of processes do we build to be able to actually implement, um, you know, so that people, as they come into the company, they're quickly acclimated to the vision and understand how they fit in and what they can do and what the impact is going to be. And so every individual is empowered to make a decision day to day of what the you know most important thing is, what the least important thing is. And that gets incredibly difficult, right? And I'm not saying that we've succeed, like, succeeded in doing that you know, as best as we could, um, but I think that's a challenge every company faces is basically creating that environment to empower individuals. And early on, get to kind of get back to the root of your question, early on, it, it is very clear, I think, because it's such a small type group, you know, what is the most critical thing to focus on? So while scaling could be something that we know is going to happen at some point later, like we're going to hit that problem, you know, that's not the problem today. And so the first problem is making sure, like you said, that we're actually building something that's going to be useful for someone and that they're going to want to pay for it, right? Because a lot of people will say, hey, this is really cool. I want to use this. And then you ask, well, how much would you be willing to pay for it? And and then they'll say, well, <laughs> I don't want to pay for it. Uh, and right. And so depending on what your go to market strategy is, that might be fine. Like maybe you're funding it through a different strategy where you, the user themselves is not paying for it, but someone's paying for it somewhere. And so you have to figure that out at some point. Um, and so I think that even if you have a lot of capital and a lot of investment and your focus is just growth, right, and accelerating user growth and having some idea of what you're going to do to prioritize you know, going to market strategy, whatever it is, is super critical. So I think we were good at that. I think we were good at having that right trade off where you know, we focused on short-term goals to hit milestones that we thought were really aggressive and we often missed, but at least we were kind of overshooting where we needed to be, uh, maybe not getting to where we wanted to be. And then very critically prioritizing things that while cool and useful and valuable and necessary, like scaling considerations, um, certain kind of processes, um, were just not critical to that mission of getting to where we wanted to be. And that's painful too, because then you know, there are things that you... You look back on and say six months ago, like if we had implemented, you know, a better engineering ladder um, and uh, having the visibility for the engineering team to know how they're going to progress, you know, it would have made it easier for this promotion cycle for people to understand, you know, where they fit in and what skills they're going to have. Um, but that was painful. But you know, we didn't do that because we spent time, you know, doing some other consolidation that was actually you know, necessary. So um, it is constantly a challenge um, in every role, but especially in, in the manager role, to basically evaluate. You know the, the important versus the urgent. So some things are urgent; you need to do that right away. 
um, well, other things are important. So you can't always trade off the important for the urgent, but you can't do the, the converse either. In your answer, I saw your board of directors hat coming in as well, because you're talking about looking at the strategy. Is that the product is viable and those kind of ideas as well, which I'm also curious about. One of the things that I've really enjoyed working at startups and I've, I've been last seven, eight years been working at startup series E, series F, right? Like that's my story, uh, especially in the, moving in, in the last eight years. And what I've learned about, uh, similar to what you said, is the feedback loop is insanely good. Like you build something, you talk to somebody, hey, I've built this. The feedback loop is immediate. You're like, hey, this doesn't work or this is exactly what I need. And that helps me understand how to iterate over the product and the overall product just matures faster. Um, and obviously, you also have to figure out how many people can you go to and uh, get this feedback from. Because if, if that chunk is really small, then the the potential for the company is, you know, questionable. <laughs> but it's it's great to know uh, that you, you've, you've done that, you've thought about those kind of ideas. So let's get into a little bit more about, um, because I'm always curious about um, you being a you know, computer scientist and more on the data and AI uh, side of things. How was the um, experience of the engineering side of things? And were you involved on that? Or were you also involved on um, the infrastructure side of things? Uh, getting into, like, let's talk about the recent years. How has how has it changed at Fiscal Note? When I came in, I was an individual contributor on that team. And then as we grew, you know, I talked about hats coming, uh, you know, in and out. Like one of the hats that I started to give up more was the individual contributor hat and put on more was the manager and executive hat in which allowed me to focus both down toward what we need to do in our overall R&D strategy, what we're working on, how we're working on, but increasingly more on kind of laterally on the other peers I had in the other organizations, like, you know, our, our sales and revenue organization, marketing, uh, operations, people, et cetera, to start to build out the broader understanding of, of what it means to be at this company, which all direct back to engineering. So, you know, I, I think of great product development, great engineering as not just the technical skill set for building and being able to code, but understanding why we're here, like what is it that we're actually doing? That might not be the core job. So you might have a product manager who's really going out there, talking to clients, getting the feedback, validating the hypotheses and bringing it back. Like, this is why we're building it. But a you know, great engineer should be asking those same hard questions from the product manager to make sure that as we're prioritizing this limited valuable time of being able to either develop feature A or feature B or reduce the risk of some tech debt C, you know, we are really putting our, our bets in the right places. As we've grown, you know, we had one product that we had to do that for and a set of product managers who did that. And then we had basically three products over the course of, you know, um, the next couple of years. And then we had 12 products and 15 products. And so, you know, we basically acquired over a dozen companies over the last uh, couple of years. And so as they came in, there were different theories and theses of why each of those products were a good addition. Some of them were really uh, kind of a partner to a product we had, and we thought we'd expand in the market. Some of them were accelerating our coverage of the market. So maybe the same kind of product, but creating like synergies between the users that we can then migrate from, you know, the one, one to the other, uh, and then sunset one of them. And so we had this, you know, larger yeah, set of customers revenue base, kind of the same products that they were serving underneath. Some of them were just a completely different uh, kind of market opportunity that we wanted to test and validate against whether it made sense for us to be in there. All of those came together in different ways on the engineering side. Uh, and so over time, this is one of the, the things that I've spent my time on personally over the last couple of years and how I've been involved is creating the right organizational structure for us to be able to operate together instead of in these silos where we started off into creating these units of being able to kind of have these squads or other kind of cross pollination to having a much broader R&D culture organization kind of global values and initiatives where you can be on a horizontal platform team underneath and serving kind of you know, DevOps, SecOps, AI, analytics, or you can be on a product specific team but either way, you have an understanding of why we're doing things, where we fit in, and kind of how each of these uh, is interacting in kind of the longer term vision. And again, it's evolving so quickly, even at our stage, that sometimes it's hard to keep up and there's a lot of communication. And, and that's almost always undervalued. No matter how many times I say communication is, is key, and it's not saying it enough, uh, basically kind of communicating all of these things. You brought up customer acquisition, right? Like, And, and that I've seen uh, from my experience that there are people who are companies who have done that really well and there are companies who have done that really badly you know and one of the things i've observed is that um or as a challenge 
when you do customer acquisition and you have a similar product or a product that you want to integrate integrate with is that they are on a completely different stack right like say for i believe you guys are on aws that's what you were uh, talking about so uh, did you face any challenges with like having a, a product that you acquired that was running on a different stack how did you go about thinking about how should we bring it in um, or did you custom bring everything and just moved containers over uh, multi-cloud? What, what, what was the strategy there? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. We've had uh, products that are running on-prem in a data center, running in a different cloud provider, running in AWS, but very differently from any of the ways that we're running with different you know, CI, CD tools and different infrastructure, different code repositories and in ways that they're doing their kind of software development lifecycle. Uh, and so there's a kind of um, formulaic corporate answer, and then there's the real world answer, right? Yeah. The, the corporate give me, answer give me is the, that. I'll give me the corporate one and then the real world. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the quick the quick corporate one, which <laughs> yeah. is, you know, everyone's going to say they have a playbook. And so, so so do we. So when we acquire a company pre-acquisition, kind of during discussions of diligence, we'll identify the, the product and technical security kind of places that, that we're at. We're just kind of taking a temperature, right? Like, it's not like there's a wrong or right answer. Um, it's very rare that that part of the discussion is going to torpedo the acquisition thesis. Obviously, if there's huge red flags and if we're acquiring it for technology, that might. But in most cases, we're um, looking at it from a much broader perspective of the, the opportunity in the market, the people that are at the company, and just the, syner you know, the synergy uh, for what they can bring. And so the tech product is just making sure we have a, a reasonable understanding of what is it going to take for us to operate this? You know, like, is it something that's going to take a huge effort where we're going to have to divert a lot of resources to get it to a standard that we want? Or is it at a place where we can reasonably keep it kind of where we are? And so that's part of the first phase. The second is, you know, once we've basically made the acquisition, there's a, a playbook for we have of, you know, things that have to happen and things that could happen. So things that have to happen, we, we have to have access to the code repository, source code, the actual infrastructure it's running on, like admin access to all the things so we can run our kind of security base level of tooling, our penetration tests, uh, other things that we need to know and, and run, like our, our you know, code uh, kind of like, security gaps and things like that. So that meets our SOC requirements and other things. Like we, we have to have those things. That happens first, right? And that's where the DevSecOps team comes in and they work with whatever the organization's you know, leads are to do that. Then the things that may happen, and that is this is where it depends, is the practical reality of, you know, is it make sense for us at the ROI of, of doing this work, the investment versus other things. So just because you're using a different database, you know, I mean, we have Postgres, we have MySQL, we have Oracle, and we probably have some others, right? I know we have some others. Um, so does it make sense for us to move you from Oracle to MySQL or Postgres just because most of the org is running Postgres? Probably not. You know, are there other factors involved in that decision? You know, are we going to migrate that data set in some other data lake infrastructure that we don't need to even know what the database underneath of it is? Is it costing us? Like, is there a license to that database that we have to pay in that, as opposed to, you know, proving it somewhere else? So, you know, we make that decision kind of on a case by case basis. And so some things will leave as they are because it just doesn't have an ROI to migrate. Other things, you know, we do have a plan for as part of a broader strategy. So like authentication and SSO, like we want to be able to get to a place where across any suite of products, it's seamless to be able to integrate and access from a user perspective and from an internal kind of you know, coverage perspective. And so that we will invest in, and that becomes part of the need to have playbook as we evolve that, and that we have a way of doing that, that we know kind of exactly what we're looking for from each team. So as we've done this over time, the need to have part of the playbook has gotten bigger and we know how to do it. And then there's still the case by case decisions on any of them that are going to be kind of what, which way do we go is basically a trade off conversation. That's probably the most quality approach, right? Like, because you don't really know until you see the source code and what, what the realities are uh, that you have to debunk or unbunk, right? Uh, so, one of the other things that I was curious about was that uh, right now, is it your product is fiscal note products are all B2B or B2C customer? I, is B2C or B2C? Or Primarily, B2B. it's B2B. Primarily, B2B. our clients are organizations that are subscribing to our products. Right. So I'm curious, you know, why not Why not have an open product for B2B users? You know, say, say I, I'm, I'm just curious, like I'm as a user saying, I want to know a legislation came out, how does that impact me uh, and place I live in? Uh, do you think that is uh, something, uh, I'm just curiously throwing a, an idea out uh, over? Of course. There. So, so yeah. we have a couple um, in front of the paywall kind of properties where, uh, we have content like rollcall.com, factbase.com. Um, there's things that you could see on Oxford Analytica or, or Frontier View if you're not a subscriber that we still want to create more information out there for more accessibility. Um, from time to time, we have launched um, public 
kind of um, accessible projects. Like you can you know, see what COVID updates, like when COVID launched, we had, as everyone did, kind of like a COVID tracker center uh, and some other things about legislative officials and, and tracking things. And so I think coming coming back from a strategic perspective uh, is something that we evaluate, you know, how much, um, what is our differentiated advantage? And I think that's important for, for every company, right? Is it the actual information? Is it how we process it? Is it the accessibility of it? I think there is definitely opportunity in the last couple of years, product-led growth has been a much, much bigger part of, I think, companies. Uh, and a lot more startups are coming out with like a, a free tier or kind of an early small paid tier, especially AI companies like that have a co-pilot uh, kind of moment strategy. Like you have like a $10 per, per month per user. And then if you see that there's enough of that, then basically the inside sales teams comes in and says, hey, we see that there's 100 people using this product. You know, would you want to get an enterprise contract? Um, so I think that's part of the strategy we're evaluating where that might make sense. And so absolutely, it's something that we think we want to do. And then there's also the public civic good, which is what you're talking about. Like, can we also make it easier for people to be able to understand their own government? And so that's something that we've also um, had some inklings of doing. And then I think we might do more. Yeah, I'm curious, actually, uh, when you guys started working on Fiscal Node, was there any other existing competitor at the time that did something or was trying to build something similar? Or were you guys were like the... Sure, uh, well, of course. I mean, there's yeah. always, I think, um, w one of the first... Uh, Hires that we've made um, was head of sales at a number of, of really large, recognizable consumer companies. Um, and one of the things I took away from him was he came and he said, you know, I didn't, and he also, it was early stages at the companies that now everyone would know. And he said, you know, like when we started, we weren't sure we had a product until this other company and this other company came along and started to try to do the exact same thing. And then we, we knew that there was a validated product need because otherwise we basically have a solution, but we're not sure if anyone recognizes the problem. If you have a couple other people in the space, that helps validate that this is in fact a real problem. That there's an opportunity and, and it should be a red flag if you're the only ones doing something. Um, I think that it's actually really healthy to have competition, both from the incumbents, right? And in the startup space. And so now we're kind of in the middle where we've been around a kind of, you know, public company, but we're still small. And so relatively there's on, on the bigger side, there's, you know, like information services companies like LexisNexis, um, Walter Schooler, Bloomberg, uh, Thomson Reuters, a lot of them have offerings that are very close in some ways in, in legal and policy and, and political information from ours. On the other hand, there's like the Economist Group and other geopolitical kind of analysis firms. On the other hand, there's other kind of advocacy tools. Because we cover such a broad area, there's a different set of competitors in, in each of these markets. Um, and there's some that are kind of closer to align to some of our products than others. But I, I mean, I agree that part of the kind of counter to what I was saying but is still um, part of it is you have these competitive spaces, but you want to try to create your own niche. And so we've tried to basically carve out a space where we feel like part of our advantages is, is this end to end connection of these different uh, aspects of the products, whether it's at the data layer, kind of some of the analysis services or the application layer. I mean, all of those are competitive potential advantages that we can say that there's a synergy in some of these things that you don't have access to if you only have some of these other uh, you know, other competitive products. You guys have been doing this for a decade, obviously, but with the, you know, I'm really excited about the amount of new companies that are going to get started and fail or remain because of all the, uh, a little bit of a, a form of around AI, right? And but you guys have vetted this AI process for a while. That's your bread and butter. So you really know the advantage of how you're going to use Gen AI uh, or in your uh, use cases, because, uh, uh, of, of course, there's summarization is one of the things that we see a Q and A and stuff like that. But the opportunity to fine tune your stuff, store that in a RAG model, and serve it to your users is a, a great opportunity. So, anyways, uh, I, I was curious about what you, what are you guys doing with that? As everyone, we're still figuring out exactly where it provides value. You know, internally, we have um, a lot of subject matter expertise where we have people who are analysts in certain countries and in certain industries, and they've been creating kind of geopolitical analysis for you know, France or Nigeria or Germany or kind of the energy sector for, for decades, right? And so we have this huge database going back 50, 60, 70 years, depending on the product, of all of this analysis, really thoughtful, structured data and unstructured analysis with charts and graphs and databases of different indicators and risk you know, indicators, et cetera. And so there's so much structured and unstructured data that we can tap into. And then we have this public uh, kind of public data side that we're basically ingesting a lot of this information and storing it. And so there is an advantage and some of that disappears from the public internet and yet we still have that archive. There's some of that, um, but I think a lot of that is, is very timely. Like you, you wanna know certain things about news now or social media now. And so uh, I think we have both of these products and both of them have internal 
people that work on them, right? There's engineers working on the data ingestion side and refinement. There's the subject matter expertise and analysts working on understanding and getting the right data source and content. And so um, LLMs and generative AI have a transformative power in both of those internal operations. Basically transforming work that could only be done by an engineer to a non-engineer is a huge efficiency gain because then you can really spend kind of your time in the most optimal ways um, and then encourages leveling up uh, on both sides, right? And then there's the uh, actual content creation work. So the editorial, the journalism, um, the analysts, and actually synthesizing information. And so that's where the power of that has been, where uh, I, you know, there's really simple things that uh, companies struggle with. Like, you know, we basically have a Google Drive or whatever it is, a SharePoint with like thousands of files. Like, when did we talk about this? Where is this? Like, everyone has that problem. And there's startups that are literally just trying to tackle that problem. Um, I mean, we have that problem too, right? So like we have all of this data, but sometimes even our internal teams aren't trying to, or are trying to uh, marry kind of things that we have internally and aren't sure where to find it or where it is. And so being able to provide that so they can create better, more informed content. But then the, the, uh, like the, obviously the hotter part is how do we expose that to users? What are the products that we're working on? And so we have a number of tiers and we think about it as, you know, some of them are gonna be much lighter weight co-pilot opportunities where you know, you don't need a whole workflow. You don't need a whole bench of, of different ways that you can work and interact. You really have like a targeted question. Like you want to come in um, similar to maybe like an expert network and say, hey, can I have an analysis of this so that I can put into a, an email or PDF, show it to my boss, whatever. You know, all the way through, you know, like I want to build an entire 50 page report on like what it's going to look like. What is our risk exposure if we launch a new product in, in the US? Or like, you know, how do I respond to this new regulatory uh, filing that's going to ban the like you know the, the part or the service that I provide in New York, and so like there's a lot of work, a lot of cognitive work, and a lot of actual manual work that goes into doing these things. And so um, we have a lot of data. We basically have been working on how to correctly uh, embed it and be able to combine it in ways that make it useful across the different data sets that we've been able to both acquire externally and create internally, and then be able to have the right chains of agents. Basically, you know, if you're thinking about kind of an LM, to be able to confidently, consistently answer questions because, you know, the big concern for us is, you know, people trust us. We have a reputation for providing actionable, insightful intelligence. And so, you know, what we don't want to do is, is ruin that, right? Be it by creating hallucinations or misrepresenting the information we have. But we also know that, you know, there's an expectation from customers that they're going to start receiving a much faster turnaround on that. And then there is going to be some error rate that people are willing to stomach as long as it's reasonable. So 80% of the work has been in making sure that the, the things that we're providing are actually reasonable and don't uh, have customers lose trust in our ability to, to provide the right product. And then um, I think what we're, we're gonna put out in the next uh, month actually or two, we're launching a few things uh, is gonna be really exciting because I think it's exactly where the market needs to move. It was a really profound answer. I mean, I, I love the fact that you have been thinking about it and because I mean, you have to, like, I mean, I, I don't know anybody who's not. Um, and obviously, uh, add another vector database to your database portfolio <laughs> for storing your embeddings, <laughs> right? Uh, it's interesting because I know uh, Postgres has uh, PG vector support, uh, which supports embeddings, uh, but there are other um, embedding databases. We at our company have been also having conversations around, should, should we um, provide that capability and we serve you know for what Cockroach does serves a tier one tier zero application that requires like high availability zero downtime um, and that is a primary use cases and it's largely OLTV transaction uh, so again going back to what you were saying we have to look at where this demand really is and or if it's just something somebody wants to see as a feature but might not primarily use right so these kind of conversations happen all the time now that you're a CTO and a decade ago, computer scientists working on code, doing stuff. Do you get to dabble with code nowadays? Do you go and uh, run those uh, RDDs on Spark or do some analysis? Or do you do some personal products for fun and figure sure. things out? Yeah. Yeah. One of the lessons that I learned uh, probably too late, if you ask my team, is that I, I cannot commit to being part of a, a sprint or a combine or, or some sort of process. Um, what's It's going to depend on me creating code for uh, kind of our, our, our software development. And so I stepped back from that a number of years ago. I What I try to do is basically still play around with things off of the side. So um, it could be research projects. So we also try to do some things, again, given my academic background, that involve some amount of just going a little bit further than the product case to the, like an academic question and being able to publish and go to conferences and, and uh, kind of be a part of that community. And so I still try to play around with that and be able to understand um, what people are working on. And uh, I guess maybe tying into one of the, the other lessons is, you know, when you 
have uh, kind of the opportunity to create yourself as, as a manager and understand where your skill sets are, you, you are going to get to a place at some point that the actual teams, the functions that the teams are performing are outside of your purview. And I think that's, um, that's actually good, right? Like I cannot step into the role and actually do the thing that every single person on my team does. I, I don't know the frameworks on the application side. I don't know the security tools on the DevSecOps side. And so it, it means that it forces me not to think about like, oh, how would I do this? Or like, what would, what would kind of, you know, like, what does this look like? But to ask more kind of questions that empower the person to make their own decision uh, and just bring the context in and understand things. And so I think even though I, I have a high passion for the AI components and the data science, um, you know, I, I would not impose myself on the team to, to be saying like, I should you know, develop this part because uh, that would be disservice both to the project and to, to them in a lot of ways. Um, but I do like to maintain like, some amount of understanding so that I can ask reasonable questions and dig in at a sufficient level of kind of the technical depth to be able to at least poke at the things that might be issues or that we might be you know, wanting to pay attention to um, that I might be either seeing through patterns about kind of other teams are, are working through or are kind of struggling through or externally. So, you know, I, I have um, a number of companies that I, I have pretty close relations to. And so I can basically pattern match across them kind of like what people are running into and where the problems are. And to bring that context back, I think that's one of the biggest things that I could do as a value uh, contribution to the team. How do you like continue to like, like in your free time, like how do you continue to learn about what's happening in the space? Because every damn day there's some new stuff that comes out and you have to learn to filter stuff out and uh, like how, how, are you, how are you managing all yeah. of that? Yeah. So I think, again, I, I don't know that I would recommend getting a PhD to most folks now. It really depends on what you want to do. But one of the big values of getting a PhD is the psychological comfort that comes after a while. Like you're very uncomfortable for a long time. You feel like everyone is scooping you. You have ideas and you validate and like you think, oh, this is a new idea. And then you realize everyone you know, has already done this or knows this. And then you kind of go through these roller coasters and you're also working on something for years, right? And it's not like you can implement a feature and get feedback. It's, it's really like, you know, your thesis takes years. And so you start to build patience and understanding. And I think that there's a certain um, kind of appreciation that comes with that, that you're not going to be able to keep up with every single thing. And so what I try to do is, you know, I, I have a number of newsletters that come in from various sources. Um, there's the various, you know, threads on social media uh, that I'll follow or um, various kind of posts on, on news articles. Um, but honestly, the backstop is usually people that I know are pointing to something. And I think that if this is important enough and it's something that is causing enough of a kind of a stir, I will hear about it from someplace. Uh, and if I don't, that's okay. Like, you know, like, uh, you know, looking back, I'm sure if you kind of did this experiment, like look at what you read last year and how much of that was relevant and how much of that actually formed your opinions and didn't probably a very, very small amount. Now, the question is, you know, you never know which part of that small, like, is it going to be like, it's the marketing quote, right? Like 50% of the marketing works. You just don't know which 50%. Um, but still, it should give you some comfort that you are able to not follow everything. And then you'll probably hear about something that's important. And it's okay if you don't hear about it the next, you know, the second it comes out, probably the next day, this week, you know, there's something that will, I, I think, catch your attention kind of segues into my one question was I was going to ask you what is the one lesson you want uh, you know young engineers computer scientists or people who are on a similar journey as yours or exploring a future uh, that looks like uh, yours as a CTO in some what would be your one lesson to them the successful uh, engineer at whatever level starting from an SE1 all the way through staff or principal knows how to work with both technical and non-technical people and I think that uh, again so like one of the the things I was thinking about when I went to go get my PhD is, oh, good, I won't have to spend as much time networking as if I went to, you know, like work at a business right away or, or some other things. And I quickly found out that's not the case. Like you basically still have to spend as much time learning what the other students are working on, learning the professors, networking conferences to understand kind of where the research is, what people are doing to kind of, like you said, get information. And so the ability to understand and work with people is basically the same as your ability to influence where the direction of the project is going, the company is going, and to guide your own development and skills. And so I think the one lesson is to get really good at being empathetic, to understand where the other person's coming from. And basically, if you're working with a product manager, to get the question of why and why we're working on something and understanding the users. If you're working with, you know, like your, your other technical peers, to learn from them, like what, what drives them, what motivations they have. Um, I mean, it's applicable in your, your personal life too. Um, and so I think that that's the one thing I see that needs more development in people. It's that they get really good at some of the technical aspects and they dive in, but they neglect the need for understanding and working with other people. And that just 
really limits their effectiveness, right? And so if you want to be effective, if you want to feel impactful, I think the ability to communicate and work with other people uh, is one that's so obvious, but often so overlooked. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, spoke like a true philosopher. I, I really wanted to get into the <laughs> human philosophy side of things for for everybody. Well, we listening. just did. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, I I, I had read some, through some of the posts you had, like your post around uh, a little bit of envy is okay for humans and machines, you know, I did want to get into some of those ideas. But you know, I have to be cognizant of the time. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Vlad. And I, the way I see this, this is like first of our conversations, because I feel like there is so much um, interesting you know, ideas that you have uh, for everyone uh, listening in. Go uh, if you want to follow Vlad. Uh, he's on LinkedIn uh, as well as you have a blog post called uh, MachineOpenings dot uh, com, right? Uh, with a uh, with an opening is O P I N I N G S. Basically, there's no E if I'm not wrong. That's right. Um, Machine opinings, like opinings, opinings. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yes, exactly. uh, but- like philosophers are wanted to. Do. Thank you so much once again for coming and thank you everyone for listening in. It's been a, it's been a great time talking to you, Vlad. Uh, so see you in the next one. Thank you, David. It's been my pleasure.